Good morning everyone, or I guess good evening or whatever time you're watching this. I'm Pastor Sigmund from Berean Bible Church, Grace Life Church. Uh, we're located in Evansville, Indiana. This is a program called Grace Life Unleashed. And uh, again, we're, if you want to get a hold of us, our P.O. Box is Box 6033, Evansville, Indiana, 47719. And here's my phone number if you want to leave a, a text or anything like that. A um, couple other places you can find us. Um, our website is gracelifeunleashed.com. Our YouTube site is Grace Life Unleashed by Dave Sigmund. And our Facebook is Grace Life Church and or Brian Bible Church. Our website and our Facebook actually link you back to YouTube when you're watching videos. And if you, if you get on YouTube, um, subscribe, please. I need two more subscribers, and I'm up to 100. And, uh, and if you hit the little alarm bell, it'll let you know, give you a notification every time. We put a new video up, and we have a Rumble account, Grace Life Unleashed. Um, th this this slide is is hard to see because I, I want it to be hard to see. I, I work with a lot of people. Um, I'm, I'm convinced I should probably be a counselor, uh, a family counselor, uh, marriage and family counselor, more than anything else. I deal with that more than anything else I do when it comes to relationships. And at, at times it's very time consuming to work with people. And people always tell me when I'm talking to them that, that they play well with others. And yet you look at this and it's hard to see because when you look at their life, it's hard to see it. They really don't play well with others. But in their mind, they think they do. Um, and, and that's the issue is, is getting along with others. Well, we're gonna start Romans 14, but really Romans, you know, 12, Romans 13, 14, all the way to the end of, of Romans, it's application. And, and the problem people have is they hit this head knowledge. They understand grace, but they don't know how to apply it properly in the sense of playing well with others. And I was speaking at Breen Bible Institute a few years back. Um, Pastor Sadler would always let me come up. He always taught Acts. This is when Paul Sadler was still alive. And Paul Sadler, every time he got to the Acts 13, he would let me come up and teach it. Because number one, I'm not convinced he understood it. And, and number two, um, when he explained it, I, I didn't even believe what he was teaching. And I'm Acts 13. So uh, that, that was the problem. So he let me come up and teach it because well, he was on the road or something like that. He would let me come up and teach it. And I always found it interesting, and Pastor Rodora let me speak in chapel when I was up there anyways. And I always told the kids, and I, I told them this, I think, three or four years in a row when I went up there. I said, the things you really need to know is the number one thing they really can't teach you here. Because you get all this head knowledge at Berean Bible Institute, and these kids come out, and they all know grace pretty well. Um, but they don't teach them how to get along well with others. They don't teach them their, what I call them as bedside manners. Uh, and, and we just need to learn to get along, not only with fellow Christians. And you're like, what do you mean, fellow Christians? Folks, I have had elders in one of the three churches I've been in fighting with each other after church. Not over doctrine. Not over anything to do with church, but over relationships in the, in the sense of, you know, who likes who and who doesn't like who and who did this and who did that. And this should not be. I mean, I'm talking about yelling, saying things that you shouldn't be saying to each other. And, and so, obviously, even though you're an elder, doesn't mean that you have all your ducks in order and things like that. But the point is, we need to work on our relationship skills because that's important because if we fail in that and we you know become enemies with somebody and they won't talk to us we're never going to have an opportunity to tell them about Christ again because they're not listening and we need to learn our people skills and how to get along again not only with fellow Christians not only with fellow grace believers but how to get along with the unsaved um, the, you know, I, I'm convinced that, you know, we should take our evangelism efforts towards the unsaved. Um, we don't need to re-save re the saved, you know, and, re and redo it. They're already saved. Uh, we need to work on evangelism, needs to be worked on the unsaved, and then edification and growth need to be worked on the saved. That's the 
all men need to, you know, be saved and then come to knowledge of the truth. Number one, salvation. After that is maturity. But once we're mature in Christ, we need to start acting like we're mature in Christ. Romans 14 can basically be summed up, I think, in this one verse. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace. Um, there's the key. And sometimes making peace means doing nothing at all. And like I like to say, take one for the team. Uh, let it go. I, I had a lady tell me the other day, why doesn't anything bother you? I said, well, a lot of things bother me, but nothing bothers me. I, I have got to the point now in my life where I, there's nothing you can do to offend me. There's nothing you can do to get me all rattled. I'm sorry, I'm not gonna get offended. I am never gonna be offended. And I've heard some of the weirdest stuff in the world. And I'm just like, okay, that's your problem, not mine. You know, I, I don't judge people, at least I hope I don't. And I, I try to always move forward and look for positive in everything I see. And I've had accusations thrown at me that were totally disgusting and totally wrong. And I just went out of life. Um, I've chosen not to fight most battles. I've chosen just to get out of life because uh, it doesn't pay. You just get out of life. So let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace. You can pick and choose the things you want to fight for. Okay, what we're going to come into really in studying Romans 14 and, and things like that is who, who's the weaker brother? Because a lot of times it's always, well, that's the other person. You know, we always think we're the spiritual one. And a lot of times, you know, maybe we're both weak. Uh, maybe we're both spiritual. But um, the issue is somebody has to, you know, let it go, I guess you could say. And uh, I, th I think the more spiritual one is the one who lets it go, and the one who's weaker tends to keep fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting. And that tends to be the problem. In Romans 14, 1, Paul starts out and says, Him that is weak in the faith. Now, an interesting thing is he, he's saying they're weak in the faith. And, and I, I think the issue there is somebody who's not mature in Christ. They, don't, they, they might have head knowledge, but they don't have heart knowledge in the sense they're not applying the grace life. And that's why I always said, apply the grace life. Understand who you are in Christ and live your life accordingly. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not with doubtful dis disputations. And what, what Paul is saying there is, not everything is a fight. Not everything is a debate. You don't have to win every battle. You don't have to fight every fight. You don't have to do any of these things. And this is something I had to learn the hard way. When I was at my uh, you know, church in Pennsylvania, um, I was talking to a guy, and some of you have heard this story already, and he ran a huge um, uh, uh, care facility for, for, for elderly. I mean, like, huge. And I was talking to him one day, and he, was a, he wasn't really a friend friend, he was just a friend. He says, Dave, why, why are you involved in so many arguments? And I said, I don't start them, I just have to continue them. And he looked at me and he said, you don't have to continue any of them. You don't have to choose to engage at all. And I'm like, no, 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 I have to make it right because they said this or they said that. And he's like, let them talk. Let them say what they want. You don't have to engage in every fight. And he said, you can pick your battles. And, and it was like a light bulb went off in the back of my head, and I'm like, duh, you know, I should have known that before. So I've got to the point now, and that, that was, you know, 25 years ago, 30 years ago already. Um, I, I pretty much don't die on any hill anymore because usually it's a trap, and I have yet to convince somebody they're wrong in regards to things. If you notice, I never argue with people on Facebook because they're not there to because they have a question, they're there to try to win an argument. And so why should I spend my time trying to explain something to them? You know, somebody is very interested, I'll spend, I'll spend all day talking to them. I'll spend as much time as need be um, because they actually have a question and they're looking for an answer and they're not looking to win an argument, okay? So if you get involved with people that are weak in the, you know, it, it says, he that's weak in the faith, receive you. In other words, you know, be friends with them, take them in, but not for adult dispensations. Don't turn it into a fight, not so you can like, you know, teach them or train them or fix them, whatever the case may be. For one believeth that he may eat all things, and we're going to deal with two things. One is going to be what you eat, and the next one's going to be, and that'll be next week, is you know what days are important or not important. And if you look at the two things, what Paul's dealing with is um, Jewish law baggage, more than anything else, because the Jews had all kinds of food laws, and the Jews had all kinds of high holy days. And so Paul's going to have to deal with that because the uh, 
the Judaizers were coming in with their law light, I call it, and they're starting to give the, the grace people some things they had to do because they wanted to put them under just a little bit of law just to keep them in line. And so Paul's pushing back on that more than anything else. And that's why he dealt, deals with those. If, if this was written today, we'd be dealing with, you know, going to movies and, uh, I don't know, something else. Who knows? Um, because these are probably not things that I argue with people about in regards to eating food. You know, very, very few Christians I talk to tell me that they are still under the food laws. And the ones who tell it to me tell it to me that it's just healthier. And I might go for it. Like I said, when it comes to the food laws, uh, I have no problem with people that say I'm following the food laws, but just don't tell me I have to do it too, or all Christians have to. Do what you want. You know, you can walk upside down every day and never walk on your feet and only on your hands. That's okay. You just don't tell me I have to in order to be saved. For one believes that he may eat all things, that would be a, a mature grace person, and the other who is weak eateth herbs. In, in the sense, you know, and I don't know if we're talking about vegetarians here, but I do think the issue is the food laws more than anything else. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. Now again, are you looking down on somebody? You're going, oh, you don't even know your Bible. You don't understand any of these things. You need to just understand grace doctrine. And so we belittle them and make them feel bad. And anytime you make somebody feel bad, they usually don't like to be around you because you made them feel bad. You know, no one likes to be embarrassed. No one likes to be, you know, put in their place publicly. No one likes any of that stuff. Um, it's just not something they want to do. And so I purposely try to never, ever put somebody in a place where they can be embarrassed. One of the things I learned years and years and years ago um, from a, a very wise pastor was a lot of pastors will pick somebody from the audience to pray. And some people don't like to publicly pray. And uh, so what I do if I'm going to ask somebody to pray, I will ask them beforehand saying, hey, can I ask you to to pray for blah, 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 blah. And I've had guys say, uh, no, please don't. Yet if I would ask them from the pulpit, they obviously would, but they'd feel terrible. And they wouldn't want to do it. Um, the same thing, you know, um, at one of my churches, we, when people would come up for an offering, you'd pick one of the four guys to have them pray. And, um, and this was in Florida, and, and Mike brought the people up, and my son, my second oldest son, was one of the, the people. And my second oldest son did not like public anything. He was a private kid. He didn't like, you know, to have to pray publicly. And uh, he, Mike looked at, at my son and he goes, um, Brad, can you um, pray for this offering? And Brad looked like right back at him and said, no. <laughs> and it just totally, you know, whoa, you know. And, uh, and my son was mature enough that he, he, he he didn't get offended by it, but threw Mike back, and he's like, oh, okay. And Mike never asked him again. And I had a chance to talk to him after this. He just doesn't like doing that. I said, he's capable of it. He would do a great job. He doesn't enjoy it. Just don't ever ask him again. And, and it worked out okay. But imagine if somebody who was very shy or somebody who got offended easily, you ask them to do it, and, and they'd never come back to church again. You're like, why would somebody not come back to church because you asked them to pray? Hey, people just do kind of weird things, and it, it's interesting. Um, we had a lady when I was in Florida that we helped her with one month of her rent because she had lost her job and, and she was sick. And one of her friends came up to me and said, Pastor, that, that lady will never be back in church again. And I said, what do you mean we helped her? And he goes, no, she's so embarrassed now because everybody knows her problems. Everybody didn't know her problems, but she thought everybody knew her problems, that she's going to not come back again. And guess what? She was right. That person never came back to church again because they were too embarrassed. And, and they were very much weak in the faith. She was a new Christian, really baby Christian, and she just didn't quite get it. But I, I've learned from those mistakes in, in how to handle people. And a lot of times it's, hey, I, I hardly ever ask somebody now to pray from the pulpit in a sense of public prayer because I just don't want to take that chance of embarrassing people. And if I haven't talked to them ahead of time, I do not ask them. Okay, but this is talking about eating things. You know, is it okay to have bacon? Is it not okay to have bacon? You know, is it okay to eat raw meat? Can you not have raw meat? You know, all of these discussions about you know should we be vegan? Vegans are not vegans. You know, I mean, can we have this? Can we have that? What about fish? What about this? And you get all these arguments. And, and Paul says, "Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not." In other words, you know, look down. And then he says, "And let not him which eateth." not judge him that eateth. It kind of goes both ways, you know? And that's because under grace, I hate to say this, it doesn't matter. 
okay? Again, you can believe or do whatever you want under grace. It's, it's one of those things to where, you know, you need rules in your life, I guess. You know, I, I've, I've basically cut down on the amount of soda I drink. I've cut down on the amount of fast, fast food, kind of, once in a while I don't. And I've cut down on the amount of junk food I eat. And, and that's helped a lot and as far as me losing a little bit of weight and trying to stay in a little more shape. But I'm not going to tell you, hey, you cannot have soda or you cannot do this or can't do that. I drink a lot of coffee. You can tell. I'm well, I'm pretty tight. I drink a lot of coffee. Some people are like, oh, no, Dave, that's really bad for you. It's probably healthier than soda. Oh, okay. You know, and, and, but I'm not telling you that you have to drink coffee and you have to get soda out of your life. I don't care. You can do what you want. You, know? you can do what you want. Um, I always get a kick out of people that say, so-and-so should quit smoking. And you know what? They probably should. But you should probably quit drinking soda. And you should probably quit going and eating all those sweets. And, you know, and you should probably do this. You know, so why, why are you judging that person and telling them how to live? And they shouldn't be telling you how to live either you know, when it comes to those. And that, that's always an interesting discussion. Everybody keeps telling everybody else how to live because they have all the answers. Granted, smoking is not healthy. And I don't care if you're smoking a cigar. It's not healthy. But you know what? As long as you're not blown in my face, I don't care. I really don't care. And I had a guy in, in, in Florida, uh, he was on my board even, and he had to go outside between Sunday school and church, and he had to go smoke. And he asked me about it, and I said, yeah, I don't care. But make sure I don't find cigarette butts out there. You know, pick up your butts. And he always did. And I said, try to be a little bit discreet about it. You know, I mean, hey, you know. But it's just one of those things, you know. We let people bring their coffee into church and, you know, drink it in front of other people, and that's caffeine. Isn't that a drug? You know, so what, nicotine and tar, that, that's, that's a bad drug, whereas caffeine's a good drug? Ah, you tell me, okay? You tell me. And again, that, that's what we're arguing about is judging people, okay? And, uh, and, and so it's pretty, you know, basic, but the Bible doesn't work like Facebook. And I found this interesting, that's why I put it on here, where your likes or opinions matter. Now, I don't know if your likes or opinions matter on Facebook either, but I'm amazed the amount of people that can tell me, I posted this and I got X amount of likes. Like, okay, whatever. Um, God's word is true regardless whether you agree with it or not. I have always said, you know, people say it, you know, the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. Um, and that's actually not a true statement. But the statement is this, the Bible says it, that settles it. My opinion has nothing to do with it. It's true whether I believe it or not. The Bible said it. And so when it comes to things, the Bible said it. So remember that. We don't work on, a, on a, you know, everybody gets to vote things. If their name isn't God, their opinion doesn't matter, and their approval isn't needed. Now, now again, this is all about judging people and things like that. Um, and, and I've seen people who have tattooed on, you know, God is the only one who can judge me. And I, and I understand what they're trying to say. You know, like, yeah, I can do what I want, and you don't get a vote. Because we have become so judgmental. We have become snowflakes to where everything offends us. When in reality, as mature Christians, nothing should offend us. I'm sorry, you should not be getting offended over things. Nothing should shock you anymore. And if it does, shame on you, okay? There was a time, and, and, and Paul dealt with this in, in Corinthians, to where you could buy meat that was offered in the heathen temple. And Paul deals in this in Corinthians, and, and we've, we've covered it over the past. But, and Paul understood that meat offered in the heathen temple was basically a waste of time, because the heathen gods weren't gods, they didn't exist. But, but the problem was those were actually pretty good cuts of meat, and the, the heathen temple sold that meat to the public at a really reduced rate, and it was good quality stuff. So Paul's like, hey... I know it doesn't do any good. You know it doesn't do any good. We can get meat at half price. I don't know what the difference was. Let's go there and buy our meat because we all know it. But then somebody who's weaker in the faith comes along and he's like, oh, I can't believe I saw Paul in the heathen temple and he was buying meat. Oh, no, he's a terrible person. And people read into things. I saw you here and there. So? You know, uh, you know, and Paul had every right to go buy his meat in the heathen temple, but he had to deal with these weaker Christians that were getting all bent out of shape because, oh no, Paul's buying meat in the heathen temple. And, and you know, it, it would just be there to eat, whatever the case may be. 
Paul said in 1 Timothy 4.4, 4, for every creature of God is good. Now again, under grace, this is a totally true statement. Every creature, including pork, including shrimp, you know, including all these bottom feeders, whatever the case may be, that the Jewish law said you couldn't. Paul says you can have it, okay? Nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. And that does not mean you have to pray for it, okay? There's no rule in the Bible that says you have to pray before every meal. And we do that because it's an attitude of gratitude, but we do not need to pray before every meal, okay? We do. It's habit. I understand that. Um, but you do not have to pray before every meal. There is no scripture to support that. You just have to have an attitude of thanksgiving. But hey, I have no problem if you want to pray before every meal. In 1 Corinthians 8, Paul says, As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things which are offered in sacrifice unto idols. Okay, this is that discussion Paul's having in Corinthians about meat that's offered to idols, and it's up for sale, and it's a good buy, and so, hey, go for it, okay? Um, eating of those things that are offered to sacrifice unto idols. We know that an idol is nothing in the world. We do know that. It's nothing, okay? And that there is none other God but one. So understand it's a lie, it's fake, it doesn't exist, okay? For th though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods and many, and lords many, but to us there is but one God, okay? You know, like, well, these people say this is a God, these people say that is a God, these people that is a God. And Paul's like, no, 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 they're not gods. We only have one God, he's the God of heaven, he's the God made in the universe, all the rest of them don't even exist. They're fake, they're lies, they're imposters, okay? So go ahead and buy some meat offered to a nothing. Didn't do a thing, okay? Um, but to us there is but one God, the Father of whom of all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we all things, and we by him. How be it, okay? So I was like, all right, you understand this? There's one God, that's all there is. The rest of the gods don't even exist. Do we understand that? And they're like, yeah, 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 okay. But... There is not in every man that knowledge. Now, what's the answer to uneducated people? Well, the answer is education. The trouble is education takes time. You know, give a man a fish, he's hungry tomorrow. Teach a man to fish, he's never hungry again. You can't teach somebody to fish in one day. You know, I know somebody's like, yes I can, no you can't. <laughs> I, I deal with fishermen in my church, and it's a lifelong learning experience, okay? Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge, in other words, that, that what? There's only one God. Some people don't, don't get it, okay? For some, with conscience of the idol, unto this hour eateth it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. If they knew that the meat they were eating was offered to an idol, they would be so offended. Now, the answer is, and this sounds really rude, why did you tell them? Okay, I, I was listening to a, a, a friend of mine preach, um, and they were talking about going to movies. It was a, it was a podcast, and I was listening to it. And then one of the guys goes, hey, do you go to movies? And he's like, yeah, but I don't advertise it. Like, oh, why not? Because I don't want to have to deal with all the backlash. And I'm like, hey, I agree with that. You know, Don't make a big deal out of it. If you had somebody over, and again, this is something that you're never going to run into in America. I have yet to go find a idol temple meat market. Okay, They don't exist, but they did in Paul's time. I have some friends over, and they go, oh, yeah, by the way, I bought this down at the blah, blah, blah temple because it was half price. It's really good meat. And the person's going, I can't eat that. Why not? Well, that was offered to an idol. And I am not going to take part in that, that, that satanic whatever. And I'm like, no, no, that's a nothing. That meat's irrelevant. It, it doesn't, they didn't offer it to anybody. I am offended. Now, I'm not saying we should trick people, but I'm saying we don't need to advertise it either. So I don't know how the people found out. I don't know what the case is. The point is, Paul said, hey, I have no problem with it, um, but there's people out there that do. Be aware of that, okay? And it takes time to teach people the truth, but hey, there's somebody out there getting bent all out of shape because Paul's buying meat from an idol temple. But meat 
commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. Okay, like, folks, if you eat it, God's not going to get mad at you. If you don't eat it, God's not going to be happy with you. This is a non-event. Okay, in other words, this is not up for discussion. What are we arguing about? God does not have an opinion here. Okay, this is grace. And he, 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 God didn't say don't. God didn't say do. It, it's, it's a neutral thing. Do what you want. Okay. And, and that's hard for people to understand when it comes to grace. You know, I used to always say God doesn't care. And people go, oh, but oh, God cares about everything. Okay. God doesn't have an opinion. Okay. It, it's like when your, your wife asks you what you want for dinner and you say, I don't care. It doesn't mean that you don't care. It means you're giving the responsibility back to your wife and saying, make whatever you want, and I'll be happy with it. That's all that means. Okay, because you say, I don't care, and then she goes, okay, we're having tuna, and you're like, oh, I don't like tuna. Well, then you do care. Then tell her what you want. Okay, I want hamburger and potatoes, meatloaf in particular, and corn, and we can mix the corn in with the mashed potatoes, and it tastes so good. You know, I mean, if that's what you want, tell her. Because she just asks you, what do you want for dinner, okay? And you need to tell her if that's the case. If you don't care, then don't care. And it's the same thing there. Uh, God does not care, okay? He doesn't care. It doesn't mean he doesn't care. It just means he doesn't care. He doesn't, it's not that big of a deal. To him, it's nothing. And that's the part that frustrates people is because there's so many things under grace to where God doesn't have an opinion. It, it, and we try to make God have an opinion. We force it on him. What car should I buy? Well, I'm going to pray to God, and God's going to tell me. No, he's not. What house should I buy? I'm going to pray to God, and God's going to tell me. No, he's not. You know, what job should I take? I'm going to pray to God and ask for God's will, and God's going to show me. No, he's not. You see, it's not that God doesn't care. It's just that God has given us, under grace, the ability to make decisions. And he's like, hey, you're mature. You're an adult. Make that decision. I don't need to hold your hand in every single thing and do what you want. You know, use your brain. That's good. Do what you want. And God's not picking out cars. He's not picking out colors. He's not picking out houses. In fact, God is not even picking out spouses. And that drives all the girls crazy because they want God to find the perfect man. You know, and then they find a perfect man and then a year later they're divorced and go, oh, I thought I got it. And like, no, you didn't because God wasn't involved in that. Now, God was not not involved in it in the sense where he was not, he wasn't sabotaging it. That was your decision. God is not in the spousal arranging business today. Now, there were times in the Bible he was, but he's not under grace. Okay. It's, it's, this is the mature dispensation to where we're supposed to act like adults. I totally enjoy my children as adults. Not that I didn't enjoy them as little kids, but I love the fact that I can talk to them on an adult level and not have to talk to them on a one-year-old level. I enjoy that so much. Um, and that's what we have, is we have an adult dispensation and adults have the ability to make decisions on their own. I do not tell my kids what job they should have. If they ask me for my opinion, I'll give them one. If they ask me for an opinion what kind of car, I will give them one. My oldest son bought a car, this would have been 10 years ago. He bought a car that didn't have a name, it just had letters, and I don't know what kind it was. It was one that took high test gas. You know, it was, it was a super turbocharged car that went too fast, had too much power, insurance cost too much, the payments cost too much, and he didn't tell me he bought it until after he bought it. And I asked him, well, why can't you didn't bounce that past me? He goes, I didn't bounce it past you because I knew you would tell me not to buy it. And I went, you're right. And I said, but now it's yours, congratulations. And about four years after he bought it, he called me up one day and he goes, Dad, I should have listened to you because these payments are killing me. I can only buy high test gas. It costs a fortune to fix because it's one of these fancy foreign cars. And he goes, I never should have bought it. And I'm like, yeah. Maybe next time you'll bounce it off of me first. You know, I was being a dad there. And I said, and now he drives a Camry and he loves it. It's a four door Camry. He said, it's paid for. And he's going to drive it into the ground and, like, that's my boy, you know. And, and, and so, okay, it's an adult situation. He was an adult. He had to take responsibility for his actions. He did. He, he wanted to know at the time when he was complaining if he should just give it back to the loan company. I went, no, no, no. You're upside down yet. You need to wait until you're upside right and then trade it in and then move forward. It took, like, another year and he finally 
because the payments were, were more than they wanted it to be. He traded in, bought a, bought a Camry, and he's been happy ever since. But hey, if you would have asked me ahead of time, I probably could have saved you a little bit of pain and frustration, but hey, I don't care. You're an adult, I'm an adult. You can do what you want, I am not offended at all, okay? But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours. Now, this is, you know, if, if you know, verse nine. I love it and I hate it because it puts the responsibility back on me, okay? I have to worry about you being offended. Let me say that again. I have to worry about you being offended. So I have to take the high road so you can take the low road. And the answer is yes. You're the weaker brother. Unfortunately, I have to bear some of your burdens. The goal is to mature you, but sometimes I can't. And so I have to deal with you where you're at. And sometimes that means, I'm in the spy, I have to cave. I have to give in. I have to let it go. I have to let you win because you're not there yet. And that bothers a lot of Christians because they don't want to give in. They don't want to cave. They don't want to have to take the high road. They want to put them in their place. And they're probably even right. But who wins in the end? You know, you might win the battle, but you're going to lose the war. And this is the people relationship business. We run that past you again. You might win the battle, but you'll lose the war. And I want you to step back sometimes and look at the big picture when it comes to relationships. Sometimes it doesn't matter. You don't have to be right. Let it go. Let it go. I didn't say you had to admit you were wrong. You just need to let it go. Okay? But take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours, which you have under grace, and he's talking here about eating meat offered to the heathen temples, sacrificing gods, okay? Become a stumbling block to them that are weak. All right, now we're back to these weak Christians again. In other words, you know, Billy is walking by, you know, the, the temple, and he looks in, and there's Paul buying some meat, and he's like, I can't believe that. I, I just can't believe it. And he gets all bent out of shape and thinking Paul is, like, compromised, and he's doing something wrong, and he needs to be, you know, lose his apostleship position, and he's got to get kicked out of the church because he can't believe it. And this guy would think that he could get away with that, and la da 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 Weak people are very judgmental. Weak people get offended very easily. I already called them a snowflake, and they are. Again, nothing should offend you. This guy's offended because he saw Paul buying meat in the heathen temple. For if any man see thee which hath knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offended, or I'm sorry, which are offered to idols? Okay, now, in other words, are you giving this weak person permission to, in their mind, commit a sin? Well, Paul did it, so I can do it. In other words, are you allowing sin to be a problem? Okay, they think it's sin, it's not, but in their mind it is. And though, and through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish from whom Christ died. In other words, you need to care about the weaker brother. Okay? Just because you know everything, just because you're living the grace life, doesn't mean you can jam that down their throat either and say, you need to lighten up a little bit. Because again, they're, they're offended. They're, they're, you know, they're a snowflake. They're, their conscience is hurt. You, know, they, they, you understand? Sometimes living the grace life can be a little bit difficult when it comes to other people. And it becomes really difficult. But when ye sin so against the brethren. Okay, now, the sin wasn't eating the meat. The sin was the fact that you offended your brother. Okay? And wound their weak conscience. I'm like, oh, come on. Now i got to worry about the fact that they're weak. Now i got to worry about the fact that they're just immature. And the answer is, yes, you do. Okay? You sin against Christ. That's the issue. Okay? When Christ came to earth, he came as a suffering servant. We are asked, as grace believers, to be suffering servants. Yes, Paul's suffering. Yes, Paul's hurting. Yes, Paul has to worry about this weaker brother who's all bent out of shape. And yes, he wouldn't have to do it, but God says, yeah, you need to. Okay? Whereas if meat make my brother to offend, and I don't like this statement at all, 
I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother offended. Paul says, okay, if that's what it's going to be, I just won't eat meat. And I can't believe he says that. I mean, the answer is education. But until then, don't do it. Don't do it. And, and you can apply that to anything you want. You know, some people get bent out of shape about some of the weirdest things. You know, you know, is it okay for a woman to wear a bikini? You know, oh no, <laughs> you know, is it okay for a women to wear high heels? Oh, you know, can women wear pants? Can women wear shorts? You know, and I deal with all these things all the time, and it's like, what do you guys even care about this for? You know, um, anyway. First Corinthians chapter three. Paul is explaining to the Corinthians the fact that they're, they're immature. And then again, that's the problem. Okay? And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, being as babes in Christ. Now this verse tells a lot of things. Carnal is um, fleshly. When someone is saved, they are fleshly. They're not mature yet. Spiritual is a mature person. It takes time to mature them up. At the moment of salvation, you are not spiritual. You're now a carnal Christian. Nothing changed except you're saved, okay? All of a sudden, all your problems didn't go away. All of a sudden, you don't have all the answers. All of a sudden, your life is not perfect. It takes time to get there. You have to grow in Christ. And this is why Paul says they're still baby Christians, okay? I have fed you with milk and not with meat. Meat is the heavier things of the Word of God. Hitherto you were not able to bear it, for neither yet are you able to bear it. Paul says you still haven't grown up. I still can't give you the deeper things of the world. Now, this is how carnal people act. This is how immature people act, okay? You're carnal because where there is among you envying, strife, divisions. If in your friend zone of Christians, people are envious, strife is, you know, this kind of always things, controversy, drama, whatever you want to call it, divisions, that's carnality. So if you want to know the, 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 what a spiritual person acts like, they don't have envying in them, they don't have strife in them, they don't have divisions in them. They get along with others. These are things that selfish, selfish, selfish versus others, others, others. And that's the mark of a mature Christian is others first, self second. Like, well, that's not much fun. I know. That's the grace way. That's the Christ way, okay? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not kind of also following people? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. <clears throat> what Paul is saying there is, is he, God is never going to hold you responsible for results. But he's going to hold you responsible for planting and watering. And that's what we're asked to do. We're asked to plant and water. We're not asked to force, you know, maturity on people. You can't do that. So neither is he that planteth anything, neither is he that waters, but God that giveth the increase. Paul's saying, I'm nothing, okay? I have nothing. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. God's going to reward you for the effort you put into planting and watering. He is not going to reward you and or punish you for results or a lack of results. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? For we are laborers together with God. You're God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. God is working through us to accomplish his will. Okay? Got somebody outside blowing a blower. All right, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. Paul says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive. And strive means have an agenda. Okay? But be gentle unto all men, apt to teach patient. This is how you get people to go from carnality to maturity being spiritually mature, okay? Uh, you don't strive or don't push your agenda on them. You're gentle, you teach them, and you're patient, okay? And then in verse 25, Paul says, in meekness, you know what meekness is? Meekness is, is power or pressure under control. You're, 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 you're long-suffering, you, you don't push your agenda, you, you're gentle, instructing those that oppose themselves, okay? Most people you talk to are opposing themselves, okay? That's what they're doing, okay? Oppose themselves if God, pre-adventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Repentance means changing their mind. It doesn't mean stop sinning, okay? 
So you're going to teach them, you're going to have patience with them, you're going to be meek with them, and finally they are going to change their mind as they come to the knowledge of the truth. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Again, fleshly, it's Satan, divisions, it's the way Satan wants it more than anything else. And that's the thing we need to look at. So as we're going to stop here now, and next week we're going to go on, and Paul's going to talk about days, okay? In other words, some people have days, and in the Jewish you know, religion, we'll call it, you know, they had all these high days, you know, Feast of Tabernacles, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Passover. And, and I think the Judaizers would come in and say, you got you got to keep doing these days. I mean, when it came to Pentecost and all these things, if you didn't do them, you weren't saved. The same thing with circumcision. If you didn't do it, you weren't saved. Same with water baptism. If you didn't do it, you weren't saved. And they're trying to put a little bit of law back into the grace people's lives. And Paul's like, no, no, no. But there are grace people that want to do that. Now, if they want to do it and they understand it's not required, just like the food laws, I don't care. Okay? And like I said earlier, you know, if you want to practice the food laws because you think it's healthier, not because you think God's going to bless you in any way, but you think it's just healthier. And I know a lot of grace people by a lot, I mean maybe 10 or so, that say, hey, there, there's some truth to the food laws. It actually makes you a healthier person. Because these, these animals that God said don't eat really aren't good for you. And I'm like, hey, go for it. You know, and I love bacon. I don't live on bacon, but I like bacon. And so I'm not giving up my bacon, but I'm not a big sh shrimp eater or a fish eater or bottom feeder. I don't eat a lot of pork to begin with, but not because of the food laws. This guy grew up on a farm, and I'm more of a meat and potatoes guy, but that's just me. But I'm not going around telling people, hey, you shouldn't eat pork, or you shouldn't have shrimp, you know, you shouldn't do that. That's the difference. The same thing with anything that offends you, you know. If, if we had a um, temple where they were, you know, selling, you know, good quality beef, and I would have no trouble going in there and buying it, you know, but someone got bent out of shape, I guess he just can't go, you know, as far as that goes. Um, there was a time years ago when grocery stores started to sell alcohol inside their stores and the Christian community was like, you do not go into stores that sell alcohol. So a lot of Christians said, hey, I'm not going to that store that sells alcohol. If you had that rule today, you couldn't go into any store, any grocery store. You know, and then there was a, a thing years and years and years ago, like if a store is open on Sundays, you shouldn't go there even Monday through Saturday. And that worked well until all of a sudden there's no place to go because every store is open on Sunday. And, uh, but again, you know, whatever you want to do is fine, but don't be telling me that that's the things I need to do. But I need to be aware that you're offended. I need to help you grow and mature in Christ until you understand grace, and that takes time. You know, we need to be long-suffering. We need to have patience. We need to be able to teach. We need to have meekness. And then let God and the Holy Spirit work through their lives and bring them to the maturity and grace. That's why Paul says, you know, God's goal is what? Salvation and knowledge of the truth. And the truth is the grace life. And the grace life can be summed up in basically two things. What is God doing today? Because that's important. And also what God isn't doing. And a lot of people don't know the difference. You know, they want to go back to name it and claim it in the Old Testament and apply it to grace. And they go, oh, God's doing this and God's doing that. No, he's not. This is a different dispensation. This is a different animal. This is the dispensation of the grace of God. You know, same thing with the message of salvation. The message of salvation today is Christ died on the cross for our sins, was buried, and rose again. And so many people, when I talk to them, tell me, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. Guess what? That doesn't save you. So what do you believe about him? I believe Jesus is God. Okay, cool. That still doesn't save you. I believe Jesus is the Messiah. Still doesn't save you. What believes you today under grace is that he died on the cross for your sins, was buried, and rose again. You have to personalize it. Make it about you. And if you believe that, you're saved. Yet when I talk to people, they tell me that you know, they're trying their best, they're living a good life, they're doing this and this and this, and I say, well, what about Jesus? Why did Jesus die on the cross? Oh, he died for my sins. Okay, do you believe that? Oh, yeah. I said, well, why did you tell me about all the things you're trusting in to go to heaven? Oh, I believe that too. You, you, you can't have both, you know. Either Christ's death was sufficient or it wasn't. It wasn't like Christ died and now I have to do my part. No, Christ died and that's all there is to do. You do not, you know, in the sense of God opened the door, now you've got to work your way through it. In that case, you're not going to make it. Christ did it all. Christ did it all. 
and all you have to do is believe. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for salvation. Lord, you died on the cross for our sins. You were, you were buried. You rose again. And either we believe that or we don't. And we pray, Lord, that everyone listening here believes that. They're trusting in Christ alone for the salvation. Everything you did when you died on the cross for all of our sins. Lord, you died for me. That was me. And I believe it. I pray this in your name. Amen.